Oh, hoi, hoi. Hello, everyone. So we're uh, pressing all the right buttons. We pressed record. We're sharing the right screen this week. Uh, there's no technical glitches. Uh, so welcome one, welcome all. Thank you for taking some time out of your day to spend it with little old me. Uh, hello, Adrian, Amy. Oh, uh, Anthony, hello. Bonjour. Uh, Gary, Glenn, Ian, Perry, Peter, Steve. Hello, Steve. Hello, Scott. Vito, hello, iPhone user three. <laughs> We've got three of you. So we uh, do these sessions every Friday, as you, most of you know. We're just waiting for everyone to uh, kind of just carry on logging in. We still see people coming in as we speak, or as I speak more specifically. Uh, nonetheless, uh, we've got a uh, fun packed schedule over the next hour. And we're going to take a little look at the market, see what's available, see if there's any uh, crashes or corrections on the horizon, see if we can find some stocks to trade. And basically, just do the same thing that we do every week and just see if there is a way that we can profit from the madness of the markets. With that said, let's dive right in. So if you are new to the schedule, usually the schedule goes something like this. We're going to spend at least 20 to 30 minutes. And as most of you know, our longtime attendees, I am a talker. So we can go up to about 60 minutes. Uh, we'll have a look at the markets. We'll have a look at anything that needs reviewing and uh, generally just try and find some good stocks. Again, we, we looked at um, several uh, positions that we've been calling out in real time. Uh, last week, we'll do something similar again. But again, for most of you that don't know who I am, this is me. My name's uh, Phil Newton. I'm a trader. Uh, I like uh, mentoring people. I get the luxury of choice to do whatever I want to do. And generally, that's exactly what I do. I like a good ramble, a read, a coffee. And for some strange and bizarre reason, I like flamingos. I don't know what it is about them. There's just something crazy that goes on on my side. I, it's something that excites me about flamingos. So I tend to spend my time visiting zoo, zoos, um, spending time outdoors and just trying to uh, basically just do some flamingo hunting. Uh, as you probably gather, I'm not a Wall Street guru. I'm not going to pretend to say that I am, um, I've worked in the city or worked on Wall Street, none of that nonsense. I did try to, uh, but uh, a series of uh, unfortunate circumstances prevented me, namely the digitization of the markets. I, I was literally just about to head off to the big smoke to seek fame and fortune uh, at some Wall Street firm when uh, Barclays announced that they'd got rid of 800 jobs uh, in the trading pits, which is where I wanted to, uh, to, to, to get to essentially. Um, and uh, the within a few weeks of my uh, career choice being made, uh, it was unmade for me very, very quickly. So I missed out on that. I think it was a good thing. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, I'm not a Wall Street guru is all I'm trying to say there. Again, I'm just a regular guy. I like flamingos and I've seen some measure of success when it comes to the stock market. I managed to figure it out um, and I have had a very long uh, career uh, just from trading the markets and doing my own thing. Uh, it is a repeatable process. I tend to refer to what I do as a production line, which means that it's simple to replicate, get results, um, not just for myself, um, but it is easy to follow. It's profitable, it's extremely accurate and profitable, as you can see from some past uh, students. Uh, I have coached thousands of people over the years. I've coached coaches who now coach other coaches to coach you how to trade the stock market with my systems and strategies. Uh, I've personally mentored quite a few people one-on-one -on -one, from retail traders through to banks, hedge funds, owners, institutions. Uh, again, the strategies that, that we use there, you'd be surprised, as you probably see, if you've been attending these sessions for any length of time every week, um, you'll know that like what I do is not complex. It's not difficult. There's several moving parts to it. And I think where most retail traders fall down is they overcomplicate this. And the institutions, the banks, the hedge funds, they're not trading complex systems. The, the caveat to that is if they're trading with uh, computers, they're trading with algorithms, they're doing the high frequency tradings, they're generally providing liquidity. Uh, there are strategies that do that, but there's no human intervention. When there's a human involved, it's really fucking simple what we do, it really is. Um, and again, most traders overcomplicate it. So hopefully we can cut through the noise, the bullshits, the minutia 
of uh, absolute bollocks and just get straight to the how do we make money so that's what i try and do every week i you know i try at some level provide um you know some mentorships and guidance just generally point them in the right direction if you want the laundry list of things that i've done i've been trading from uh, since 2001 hand drawn charts since the early 90s blah 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 all that stuff that you can read there you can press pause if you're watching on the recording um or you can just very quickly read it you may have seen me on some other financial websites been interviewed uh, by a few people in various places and again as i mentioned what i tend to refer to my process as a production line and these are the three categories that it falls into we have a mechanical scan which is the uh you know one of the the, the many secrets to the success this is what allows me to go and do other things this is the the bit that means that i'm not flicking through chart after chart after chart it's a replicatable process to find filter and sort the best stocks right now we're going to go and look at exactly how that is done right now to find some opportunities and then we're going to look for our visual confirmation is it one of six money making blueprints uh, that i like to use I was counting them up. I was reminded um, in the week, actually, when I first started out, I actually had 34 different names patterns um, and I tried to trade them all very early on. Um, it, as I was alluding to a moment ago, it's very easy when you're at the new end of the spectrum, try and do everything um, and look at everything and trade everything, whether it's Dow 3, GAN 3, Elliott Wave Theory and all the other nonsense and patterns and, and fluff and filler. And what you'll realize is that when you review your trades, and I would suggest that everyone does it, if you're not already doing it, you should you, you write them down, journal them, keep a track of things, because what you'll find is that it's that Pareto's principle, you know, 80% of your results come from 20% of your efforts. So what I figured out is there's actually three, there's actually three trends, and there's only six ways to make money from those trends. So I just focus on those things. I don't tend to worry about what the name of those patterns are anymore. I, I'm not trying to label, I'm not trying to categorize them. I just want to know, like, you know, is it one of, you know, the six ways that I can make money? Great. If it is, let's, let's trade. If it's not, let's go look at something else. And the third step is trade craft. And um, we're going to look for entries, stops and targets, and we're going to look at uh, any uh, adjustments and corrective trade management along the way. And that pretty much is the categorization uh, of what we're doing. And for the most part, you can fit a strategy, a, a, a positive expectancy, which is the fancy way of saying it makes money, um, into this process. And this is what I refer to my production line. Uh, I like to use moving averages uh, in the mechanical scan. At the moment, if we were talking three years ago, we would have been talking Bollinger Bands. You can use any tool and indicator as long as you know how you're doing and what you're looking for. Again, we'll, that, we'll explain that in a moment. But that's essentially the process that I use and what I like to follow. Now, before we do get into it, um, I'd like to just kind of not necessarily dedicate uh, 20, 30 minutes to a discussion, which is what I sometimes do, as most of you know. I just want to dedicate just five minutes to a thought because... There's only three things that you actually need to make a successful uh, trading or to be successful at trading in the markets. You need, and I toyed with the best way of saying the uh, number one, but number one is kutzpah, uh, balls, big balls, lady balls, however you want to phrase it. You know, it, it just take the intent as opposed to what I'm saying. You need confidence in what you're doing. You need a bag of cash, of course. You need a strategy. So, you know, which one of those three don't you have? Um, and there's a good chance if you're not seeing the types of success that you're expecting, then you're probably missing one of those three things. It's usually a strategy. Uh, most people don't have one and you don't have to go very far uh, noodling around the internet. You can go and search, uh, you know, one of the popular forums uh, You probably don't need to uh, need me to point it out, but you can go and have a look at one of the, uh, the, the mainstream uh forums that have been in the news recently and you can see the absolute insanity of people who just don't know what they're doing and i'd be very tempting tempt i'd be very tempted to bring out the profanity swear box um but i'm gonna put myself on a little bit of a leash this week because it makes me angry it really does make me angry i mean if you look at the and this is just in the last few days you know 
there is a phenomenon called loss porn. And this was a new concept for me. Like I, I, for anyone who's known me for any length of time, I tend to keep myself to myself. I don't stick my head above the parapet, the internet parapet and look around. I don't surf the internet. I'm a little bit strange like that. I just want to do my own thing. But then occasionally I will. And I, like five minutes into an internet search, and this is what came up just from this week. Loss porn is a new phrase. I didn't even know that that was a thing, but guess what it is? These are losses that people have experienced on a single trade in the last week, $93,000. Now these are calls. You know, people are losing money hand over fist because they don't know what they're doing. 22,000 lost, 24,000 lost. Alibaba lost 10,000. Uh, dollars should i buy more like that just tells me straight away that they don't have a strategy i don't know their arse from their elbow when it comes to uh trading sixty thousand dollars one position thirteen thousand eight thousand uh five thousand all of these are in one account these are open positions you know he's not closing he's hot, what, what we might term as a bag holder sqqq what have we got this is a, an inverted leveraged etf well, that's the first problem. It's an inverted leverage DTF, you know, <laughs> and looking at it, it's uh, calls and the markets are only going up, meaning that if the stock market was to crash, this would pay out. But the stock market's going up and it has only been going up for the last 12 months. You know, so you've got to wonder what on earth are these people thinking? There's no strategy. There's no rhyme or reason. Uh, Clover, $70,000 loss. Yeah. Again, I'm pointing this out because... There's no risk control. And it really, I'm exasperated. You know, and to be fair, there's, there's lots of lols in the, um, in the chat box. I'm not pointing this out to, to laugh at other people's misfortune. Please don't mistake my intent behind this. What I'm trying to highlight is that these people don't have a strategy. And when you don't have a strategy, any, whether it's mine or someone else's, like this is the problem. This is uh, gambling. This is what it looks like. People are just placing trades, hoping to win the lottery tickets. And you might as well just burn the cash because there's no strategy involved. And here's the, and here's the thought that I want to leave you with. If you had a, a real world business, then you would uh, create a business plan. You would probably go to a marketing consultant, a business consultant, an IT consultant. You would get expert advice to help you with your business venture, your startup or your uh, business exploration. You know, you would seek expert advice from people who know what they're doing and have, have a proven track record. But as soon as we step into the world of the stock market, all of that goes out the window. And then this is what happens. This is what happens when you don't have a plan of action, any plan, a strategy what is what we might call it. And more importantly, risk control. What am I going to do if this trade idea doesn't work out? At what point am I going to pull the pin? If equally, when it goes to target, at what point am I going to take profit? You know, these are people who are, don't have a plan. And these are smart people, you know, to have this money in the first place, to have this money in the first place, they've got to have seen some success elsewhere in their life. You know, they've, they're doing okay in other areas of their life. But then as soon as they go to the stock market, they piss it up the wall. So give it some thought. Before you risk a dollar of your hard-earned cash on the markets, just think about what you're going to do. Now, my foot, and I'll leave it at that. Again, an important lesson for everyone. Um, it, it, it really is heartbreaking, heart-wrenching to see this. And this, for most, these are life-changing amounts of money. Life-changing. You know, on one trade, you know, regardless of your net worth, it, it's like just dropping $100,000 in probably a few weeks or a few days for that matter is, um, is heart-wrenching. And that assumes that these are long calls. I, I, I don't know if there was details. If they're short calls, that's a margin call. That's like, I don't have that cash and my broker is phoning me for a margin point. Actually, it's 90% loss, so that uh, I'm going to guess that they've um, uh, purchased them. You know, if they're short the calls, there's a, an unlimited risk involved uh, attached to it. You know, they, they could end up uh, quite literally losing the house, betting the farm because they were betting the farm. And it's absolutely crazy. So my uh, cautionary tale is to not follow the insanity of other people. 
And again, whether it's my system or someone else's system, just get a system, get a mentor, get some guidance, get some help. My first strategy, just to give you some simple guidance, my first strategy used a hundred period moving average. And if it was a, and in fairness, this is the 200, but you know, the, the hundred period moving average, if price is above the hundred period moving average, buy pullbacks. If it's below the 100 period moving average, sell pullbacks, buy the dip, sell the rally. It was so simple. And it, it beggars belief that people don't even have that sort of simplicity. And uh, a pullback, for example, we would have a, a price rally, price retracing, buy above the high. As price rallies, it would trigger you in the trade. Your stop loss goes past the previous uh, the, the lowest point of the retracements, and that is your risk parameters. So if you never see me again, if today's your first day, you know that's your risk, and then you can start thinking about again, just keeping it nice and simple um, on the the risk to reward. You're looking for you know two or three times that risk, two or three times. You don't have to go crazy to get a lot of cash from the markets. You don't have to go crazy to get a lot of cash in the markets. Just look for two or three times your risk. Um, and that is as simple as you need to make it. And again, back of the envelope, that was my first strategy. That is all I did for 12 years. Let me say that again. That is all I did for 12 years. A uh, good question from, uh, from Amy. Hopefully I'm pronouncing your name right. Again, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so if you're risking $1 here or one point or 10 points, let's call it 10 points. So if you're risking 10 points, insert your own number, two times or three times. So you're looking for 20 or 30 points. It could be $1, $2, three. You see what I'm saying there? So, it, so two to three times the risk. So if you're risking, so that, that whatever the pattern that you're using, your stop loss size, you should be looking for two to three times the, the risk or of the, the stock charts. And that's essentially what you're looking for. Now, I trade with uh, options. And again, I've got lots of my uh, students in today. Uh, we do it a little bit differently. But if you're just trading stock or you're just trading futures, you know, and you're just wanting to do it in the simplest, easiest possible way, then just whatever your risk is and make sure it's sensible. In fact, let, let me, I wasn't planning on going through this, but let, let's just go through a practical example. Practical example. Again, the time frame, the, the, um, the uh, chart doesn't matter. Again, this is a daily chart, um, but you can very easily look for, so there's your rally. There's your retracements, entry above the pullback eye. So that would be your risk, entry above, stop loss below the low there. And whatever the size of that is, that's your risk because you're entering here and you're going to close out the trade. If it's not working out, that's where you're going to say, you know what, it's not working out as I expected. That's when I'm going to close the trade. And that is a risk at risk defined trade. So when you know that distance, let's just say that that's 10 points, then you're going to aim for 20 to 30 points. That would be two to three times risk. Again, I'm just giving it back at the envelope. This assumes that you don't know how to calculate your own targets because you can do it slightly differently. But again, just a very simple way. If you're risking 10 points, then you want to make 20 to 30 points. Because otherwise, the, 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 the probabilities and the numbers don't add up. Again, I teach my uh, students uh, a more detailed way of doing this. But again, just for, for, for this free Friday open house, for a back of the envelope discussion, again, this will keep you on the right side of the market. And if you can get that trade on as close to the, you know, the frame of reference, again, I'm just using this um, 200 period move and averages reference. If you can get your trade on as close to that as possible, or the 50 period move, and my apologies, that's the 50 period move and average. I do apologize. The 50 or the 20, if you can get your trade on as close to those levels as possible, then that's going to help increase that risk to reward. You're still going to have the same risk, but that might mean that you can get instead of two or three times, maybe you can get five to seven times because you're able to refine. And that type of entry will come with experience. Uh, you should have a good mentor that will be able to describe how to do that. That's certainly how I teach my traders to do it. But in the absence of that, again, just for speed, we've got a few um, kind of low risk ways of uh, finding entry opportunities. So hopefully that helps. Again, I'm just trying to give you, I, that was my first strategy. I, again, 
buy pullbacks above the, the 100 period moving average or, or sell rallies below the 100 period moving average. Again, I tend to use the, 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 uh, the 200 these days, the 50 period moving average and the 20 period moving average. Uh, they're my typical frame of reference for, um, for trend trading, classical trend trading. And again, just coming back to the, the, the points, again, it doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be clever. Um, I've adjusted and evolved my strategy over the years because obviously after you know almost 30 years of doing this now, um, you, you kind of pick up a few tricks along the way. You, your depth and breadth of understanding gets greater and greater. And that's the only thing that I can't give you is that experience. You have to get that yourself. Only time will give you that. Um, but for again, just come back to the point, for 12 years, all I did was buy dips, sell rallies, buy the dip, as it comes back to it's so a rally retracement, it's back to the moving averages, rally retracement, it's back to the moving averages, re, you know, rally retracements, back to the moving averages, rally retracements, it's back to the moving averages. Can we see a reoccurring theme here? Rally retracements, it's back to the moving averages. Where do you think the next move is going to go? But let's throw that question open. Where do you think the next move is going to go? Is the most likely direction up? Or is the most likely direction over the next several days down? Yeah. I think this isn't. I, I, I caught myself about to say something absolutely stupid. <laughs> I very nearly said this isn't rocket science. <laughs> um, uh, Amy, yes, it, this is the S&P futures. So this is ES. Uh, but you could also be looking at SPY. It's, it's set, for all intents and purposes, it's the same instrument. But let's go and look at it just so you can see. So we can look at SPY in the same way. So you've got the, um, again, you can see rally retracements. It's the same chart. Now, it looks a little bit gappy by comparison because this is an ETF, an exchange-traded fund. For all, again, it effectively behaves like a stock. I like to look at the futures when I analyze the indexes because although it's the same data, it's essentially 24 hours. Again, we can see what is going on. Again, we're 10 minutes to the markets, uh, 10 minutes to the markets uh, opening. Again, let's look at the left here. We're gonna be up about 20 points. We're gonna be up about 20 points on the S&P. So that's about $2 on SPY and lo and behold, $1.80. So it's almost to, almost uh, you know comparison. So I can see the movements before the market opens because it's, it's not quite 24 hours, but it's, as good as 24 hour market. So I just get to fill in the blanks around the, uh, the regular US stock market opening times. Uh, absolutely, yeah, and Glenn raises an interesting point um, that the likely direction is up. And again, the best we can say, I, I suppose as well, this also is one of the things that trips up a lot of novice traders who don't, unfortunately don't know any better is that there is nothing set in stone. And you, you, uh, your, your comment there, Glenn, is absolutely spot on because Glenn adds, unless it breaks a support level, unless it breaks a support level. So what we've got to say is, uh, and the way I like to phrase this, Glenn, is until something new happens, the same thing is most likely to happen. And no one can say with certainty whether something will or won't happen because no one knows what's going to happen tomorrow. No one can predict the future. Anyone who tries to convince you that they know exactly what's going to happen tomorrow is probably, you know, pulling a fast one. That they're not telling or they're, they're, they're uh, um, uh, lying to themselves more than anything. The best we can say when it comes to the market is the most likely thing to happen next. And that, that's all I'm saying. The most likely thing to happen next is that the stock or this chart will go up, price will move uh, upwards. And uh, as Glenn rightly pointed out, unless something new happens, so if it breaks support, so we've got what we can call the 50 period move on average support. Again, these black lines are a trend line. We can see that it seems to be very rigid. So if price was to go, if I just draw a line, so I'm just going to um, sign to the chart. So if I just look down, uh, to the 50 period moving average, which is right there, and then just look across the chart. So I can just say, well, let's just randomly call that an, an arbitrary point. And why am I picking the 50 period moving average? I'm using that as my frame of reference because it held there. It held there. It held there. Every time it's come back to the 50 period moving average, price has held. Now, it's not because the 50 period moving average is magical or mystical. 
it's just a frame of reference. I'm just using it to help me say, well, this is what's happened the last several times. And we could be using a move on average. We could be using a trend line. We could be using Fibonacci. We could be using down three, down three. Pick, pick your tool. It doesn't matter about the tool. I'm just using it as a lens to look at the charts to help me have a frame of reference. So what I can say was, well, it could come all the way down to 4,400 on the S&P. Uh, or, uh, and if we're looking at SPY, $440 approximately, it can come all the way down to there and still be in context with the trend. Does that last point make sense? Just pop a little yes in the chat box. Let me know if that makes sense. It can come all the way down to 4400 and the trend is still intact. Yeah. Now, I just, what I'd like to point out, awesome, thank you for, for all your uh, um, the yeses and agreements there. I'd like to point out, I've not done anything clever. I've not done anything creative. I'm not doing anything that you can't replicate. All I'm doing is saying, well, does the bit on the right in real time, does it look like any of the points on the chart, any of the points of reference on the left? And based on that, I can start to forecast or predict or formulate a hypothesis or Pick your own fancy phrase or saying. It doesn't really matter. I don't really care. But I can start to figure out, well, what might happen next? And then I can formulate a, a trade idea. I can go and put that trade on. And it's most simple. It's buy the dip because that is the most likely thing to happen. Price is going up. It is in context with the trend. It's come down to the 20 period moving average on this occasion. It's not yet at the 50. So if price was to uh, carry on going, and to be fair, it's Friday, uh, it wouldn't surprise me if we saw a big Friday finish. Um, you know, if we see price go above uh, yesterday's high, we saw price turn around, but if it goes above yesterday's high, it wouldn't surprise me if we saw a big green bar and attempt to close on a new high for uh, the session, uh, possibly a new all-time high. It, it's possible. So that's one scenario. Now, it's the most likely scenario, but let's think about other. Let me just uh, zoom in. Let's think about other scenarios. So that's the most likely scenario to happen. It's the most likely scenario. doesn't mean it can happen. doesn't mean it will happen, but that's what I'd expect. And again, when you've looked at the charts for any length of time, you'll start to spot these things. You'll start to spot these. Um, scenarios. I mean, again, that, that's the sort of, again, now that we've zoomed in, can we see, can we see? <laughs> Spot the difference. A little bit of a, an exhaustion bar, a little bit of an exhaustion bar, takes out the high, takes out the high, takes out the low, um, not quite on the same day, takes out the low, and then we get that big turnaround bar. Is it possible that this today, Friday, is going to be something similar? And it, just because I zoomed in, I just saw that kind of similarity. It takes out the high and the low of that uh, previous day. We've already had that in one day. So it wouldn't surprise me if that expectation that we just went through uh, happens. Really wouldn't surprise me because that's what we're expecting to happen. And it's in context with the trend. The trend is up. That's the, the money flow. That's the direction of the overall charts. Um, you know, why would we want to go against the money flow? Again, the main money flow is up. Again, I, I can't understand why it is <laughs> because, because the stock market just only wants to go up at the moment. Per personally, I'm bearish. My viewpoint, my opinion is bearish. It has been for a long time, but I can't, I'm going to go broke trading my opinion. And I think trying to separate those two things, what's my opinion? Okay, I'm bearish. I think we're going to see a crash. I, I, like I, at the very least, a deep correction. I'm even calling it on the 17th of September. That's when I think we're going to see it happen. Seasonality, cyclical analysis, all the things that we've spoken about over the last several weeks, that's when I think it's going to happen. Now, that's my opinion. I don't know that it will happen. I'm prepared for it. I'm positioned in my portfolio for the possibility that it could happen because I'm prepared to put money where my mouth is. But until it does happen, I don't know if it will. And I think that arguably is one of the things that a lot of new traders, which come back to the point earlier, that, that's what they can get hung up on is the need to be right. I don't need to be right to make money. Again, ultimately, it's going up. I've got to be bullish. I've got to be a buyer because the evidence in front of me is saying it's going up. Therefore, I must 
be a buyer. And I am a buyer and I am bullish. In fact, I'm 100% bullish in my portfolio. But because of the hedging strategies that I've got, I've got about 35, 40% bearish exposure because of some of the hedging strategies that I've got going on. So although it's a bullish portfolio, I'm, I'll benefit if the stock, if the, the stock market correct, uh, crashes or corrects or does anything weird and funky, I'm going to be okay. It doesn't matter which way the market goes. It's not about being right. It's about managing the risk. Nonetheless, we all like to be right. We're, we are human after all. Um, so we've got a, a directional bias. It's going up. So let's think about the possibility. Well, what if, what if that doesn't happen? What if there's a bearish scenario? So one of the things that you can do, and this is what I've just uh, illustrated, what if that viewpoint doesn't come good? What if prices go down? I could use the move and average. I could, sorry, I could use the 20 period move and average. I could use the trend line that I've drawn here as a short term frame of reference. I could say, well, in the short term, because I'm expecting this bearish uh, down cycle, very similar to what we saw over here, expecting a, a, a hard and heavy and probably very short lived sell off. Could I use that? If it goes below the 20 and that move and average, my apologies, the, the, the trend line and the move and average. So let me just go right across the chart. And let's just say, let, let's be a little bit concerned. Let's say 4460. If price goes below 4460, let's say that that is my line in the sand. When it goes below there, I can be short term bearish. So now I've got a scenario for if my primary scenario is right which we think it is because it's the money flow. It's, it's the, the, the overall bias of the market for the moment. We've got history over here to suggest that that's going to repeat over here. Great. We've got a footprint, short-term temporary, not in any textbook footprint, just an observation in price to suggest that, you know what, it's probably going to go high. It's going to be a big Friday finish. And we've seen that in fairness for most of this year, big Friday finish. Everyone's happy. But what if it doesn't happen? We've got a line. Of, I've got now I've got a secondary scenario. If price was to go lower, below that 4460 uh, level, then I can be temporarily bearish counter trend. And I can say, you know what? Maybe if it comes down to, the, maybe my target counter trend is down to the 50 period moving average. Now you are not, now counter trend, you're not going to get risk reward ratios. Understand that. Does everyone understand that last point? Counter trend, you're not going to get risk reward ratios. Two to one, three to one. You're not going to risk one and make three. It's not going to happen. Let it go. You're going to, at best, risk one to make one. At best, you're going to risk one to make a half. 0.5. That counter trend, that's a reality. You're going to be risking more to make less because it's counter trend. So. Over here, we saw that happen. It went below the uh, below the uh, the twenty, uh, went below the moving average, and ding, it went straight down to the fifty period moving average. So again, we've got historical precedents to suggest that it could happen. I don't know if it will until afterwards, and that therein under underscores again one of the things that most novice traders have difficulty getting over. And now that you're aware of it, you'll know that you can try and put it to one side. It's not about being right. It's about thinking about scenarios. If the market goes up, I'm going to make some cash if it goes up. If it goes down, I'm going to make some cash if it goes down. doesn't matter if it goes up. I don't have to be right on that. It doesn't matter if it goes down. I'm going to make money on that. But it's not about being right. I'm just trying to think, well, how can I position myself either in a single trade or multiple trades or in my portfolio, so that whichever of these two scenarios happens, whichever one happens, and probably it's going to be both. We're going to see the rally, then we'll see the sell-off. That's probably what's going to happen, because it's normally a hybrid. But I've got them defined. If it goes up, what's my plan? I'm positions. I'll profit. If it goes down, I'll, I'm positions. I'm, I'm going to profit if that happens. If both those things happen, I'm going to profit on the way up and I'll profit on the way down. And that is how we can not care about what's going on in the world of the stock markets. Unless, uh, Anthony, if there's a crash, that would be wonderful for the way that we manage our trades. So, uh, um, so counter trend, 
But Amy, it's it's not the it's not counter trend below the moving averages. I'm using the moving averages as a frame of reference. Understand the distinction. We've got precedence for price. Let me just zoom out. We've got precedent on this chart, aka a frame of reference, to say when it goes below the 20, it goes to the 50. When it goes below the 20, it goes to the 50. Again, really close there. Unsurprising. We've got separation between the moving averages. It goes, it tries it once, twice, goes down to the 50. It goes below the 20, down to the 50. Below the 20, down to the 50. Below the 20, down to the 50. We're at the 20. If it goes lower, Below the 20, do you think it could go to the 50, but no further? And again, coming back to your point, uh, Anthony, unless there's a crash, if it, it, it shouldn't matter if there's a crash, you're short. If, if you're short below the, in this example, our scenarios, we're short, like I'm positioned in my portfolio, it doesn't matter. I don't have to physically place the trade. I've got bearish exposure because of the hedging strategies that we have in place. I don't need to worry about it. I've taken care of it over the last couple of weeks. But if I wanted to put a dedicated trade on and short some futures, that would be okay too and take advantage of the short-term uh, trade setup because we've got an expectation that it could happen. And if it does happen, I can place the trade. I'm not going to do it before that condition has been met, aka below the 20, but it could go down to the 50. And if it was to crash, if it was to crash, then I've got the short trade on because if it's going to crash, it's going to go fast <laughs> and it will go past the 4,400 target, the 50 period moving average targets. And we'll just go like a hot knife through butter. Well, guess what? That's exactly what happens back uh, in the big one. For anyone who's been with me for any length of time, will know that this is what we're talking about. I talked about this, uh, from November, so there's November 2019. This is March 2020. We all know what happened in March. Back in September, October, I would uh, so there's September, there's November. So all the way back here, I was talking on uh, my podcast. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I was doing these open house sessions there then, but I was openly talking about it every week on a podcast. You can go back and fact check me. I'm looking for a correction. 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 But you know what? I'm wrong. 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 Doesn't fucking matter if I'm right or wrong. I'm expecting it. I was positioned about 40% bearish uh, all the way up here. It didn't matter that I was right or wrong because 60% of my portfolio was bullish. So I'm making money on the, on the run-up. I'm losing money on part of my portfolio. That's normal in a portfolio. But guess what? I'm hedged. If it goes up, I'll make money. If it goes down, I'll make money. Now, I thought that we were going to see a correction. I thought we were going to see a 10 to 20 percent correction. We've spoken about this at length in the past. Uh, it's on uh, YouTube if you want to go and have a look at it. Um, corrections happen once a year. They happen uh, in February, March. They happen in September, October. That correction is usually about 10 percent in 10 days. That's what I was expecting over here. Now, it didn't happen in September, October, uh, November, so we missed a cycle as far as I'm concerned. So we're over to March. Is it any surprise that it happened? No, it was a surprise that we had a crash. They happen once every 10 years. When was the last crash that we had? 2008. It was 12 years previous. It should be no surprise that these things happen when you become a study of the markets, when you've got your eyes open, when you're looking for uh, you're looking through a frame of reference. So again, the point I'm coming to, we have the same scenario. If it goes below the 20, below the 50, we can aim for the next movement average, the 200 in this case. So they're just a frame of reference. And we could have used price action analysis. We could have used Fibonacci. We could have used some square of nine. You know, We can look at it through any lens, Whatever lens you're familiar with, that's okay. If you want to use down three, use down three. If you want to GAN, use GAN. If you want to use Fibonacci, use Fibonacci. I'm just using moving averages. If we were talking three years ago, I would have been looking at this through the lens of a Bollinger Band because that's what I was using back like three, four years ago. There's no particular, I'm not married to one tool over the other. I just found that, you know what? 
Bollinger Bands wasn't quite doing what I wanted to help me find trending price behavior. Uh, I was also more and more looking for, okay, well, what are the institutional traders looking at? And they're looking at these levels, these, the, 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 the 20, the 50, and the 200 period moving average. So I switched over to start looking at, well, what are they looking at? Because maybe I want to look at what the big dogs are looking at, the people who move and influence the markets. That's important. That's the money flow. Now, I was already looking at the 20 period moving average via the Bollinger Band. So I already had that frame of reference. Because that's, if you weren't aware, that's the, the, the center of the calculation for Bollinger Bands. Oh, I'm rambling today, folks. I, I, let me know where you're at, folks. Is, what's your takeaway so far? I mean, I, I, what I was planning on talking about is I, I've not covered it. I think it's an interesting discussion. It's a timely discussion. But what's your, um, what, are you, what are your thoughts for the moment? Does this, is this help? This is, it, it's almost a lesson in uh, price action. Uh, I think it's uh, using indicators to indicate they're not signal generators. Um, we're using them as a frame of reference to help us interpret the charts. And I think when you can start to think in those terms and then layer on, well, what's the bullish scenario and what's the bearish scenario, then you can start planning for, well, it doesn't matter about being right anymore. It literally doesn't matter about being right because all our traders made a shit ton of money as price sold off. Metric ton of money. Because we were positioned before the move happened. And that's what I'm trying to suggest. When you do it right, when you think about a portfolio and you have exposure, it suddenly doesn't matter what happens next. It's just how much money are we going to make? how much money we're going to, that, that's really what it comes down to. And it, it sounds crass to say it that way, but you know, that's why we're doing this. We want to make money, but then it's just like any other business. If we had a bricks and mortar business, some of you do, I, I've spoken to individuals. Some of you, some of you may work for a real business. <laughs> Maybe some of you own a real business. Um, um, but if we had a real business, we would be planning for these things. What's the cycle? Do we have a seasonal? Can we have a special offer? We've got um, uh, Halloween coming up. Great, let's do a Halloween promotion. You'd be thinking a month or two months ahead for your marketing promotions. You'd be thinking about budgeting. Uh, maybe you've got a quiet period that is seasonal to your business. So maybe you want to make sure your cash reserves are stocked so that you can get through a quiet September or a quiet October for your business because of, I don't know, because it's the holidays and people are going to firework parties or whatever else, and they're not coming to your restaurant or they're not coming to your business or whatever the thing is. We do it in the real world. There's a thousand examples that we just take for granted every day of the week, the month, the year, and we live our life around these principles that I've been through. But as we said right at the beginning of the, uh, the session, as soon as we step into the stock market, it just disappears. It goes out the window. We forget about it. We don't consider it. And the stock market business is no different to any other business. It's no different. And that's all what makes it maybe different is that we're doing all of our planning using a very, or well, certainly from a charting point of view, using a visual medium. I'm using charts to make these decisions. And we can do the same thing with some form of financial analysis if we have the real business. But we're doing all the same things to plot the seasons, to plot the seasonality. Where's my special going on? You know, is Amazon running a Black Friday or a Black Monday or a Black Week sale? Can I take advantage of it? Can I piggyback on it? Well, let can we do the same thing in the stock market? You've already got these skills for critical thinking. And hopefully what I'm trying to point out uh, as I'm kind of summarizing what we've done so far is that critical thinking that you've got in the real world, when you think about these things at other times and other areas of your life, they're completely transferable and applicable to the stock market. Ooh, right, let's catch up on the comments. Uh, Amy, thank you very much for your kind words. Perry, again, thank you for your kind words. Sure, sure. Uh, I'll come, uh, Perry, uh, I'll just pick up on the comments. Hello, um, Perry's wife, <laughs> who is watching with you today. Let's go and look at that. Let's go and uh, do the thing that I promised you uh, at, right at the beginning, which is to go and look at the, uh, the, the mechanical scanning. 
So as we said, let me just back up slightly. Bear with me. Do, do, do. I've lost my little slide. Oh, there, there we go. That's what we're looking for. So there's three steps to my overall process. The, to put it into context, what we've just done, mechanical scan, visual confirmation. So we've just gone through discretion, discretionary analysis. What's my view? What's my opinion? And that neatly slots in here in the process. It's not essential. It's not critical to the process. But after we've done the other stuff, the discretionary elements, we can slot it in there. It's one of those optional extras. I'm just trying to give you a, a framework for where that fits in. I normally do it after the bit I'm about to show you. So uh, just for uh, Perry's wife, uh, what, what's, your, what's your wife's name, Perry? And maybe I can say hello properly. But we're going to go through the uh, mechanical scan and we're going to try and... Uh, hello, Laurie. Um, we're going to find... Uh, some stocks to trade. So first and foremost, let me turn the chart off. Let me turn the chart off. So the uh, the chart is intentionally blank over here. You won't be seeing anything. We're going to focus all our attention over on the left. Focus all our attention on the left. The first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to look for one of the um, uh, a trend. So there's uh, four stages to a trend. So firstly, I'm looking for the average prices that we were just looking at to be crossed up. That's going to help me determine if on average we've got a trend. The second thing that I'm going to look for is I want to make sure that that trend has been in effect for at least 40 days to help me avoid those false starts, false alerts. The third thing that I'm going to do, so that was the second. So the third thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look back over 60 days and say how much of a percentage of movements has price moved. So that was step number three. So there's three elements to a trend. And I can do all of that over here on the left. So the first one is which way are the average prices crossed? I'm just highlighting the column that I'm looking at here. Which way are they sorted? In fact, let's actually just sort them bullish to bearish. So we've got that now. So these are all the stocks that are bullish and these are all the stocks that are bearish. So if I want a nice balanced portfolio of bullish and bearish stocks, I've just divided them and it's about 60-40 split, and that's kind of normal. It's always going to be 60-40 uh, bullish or bearish, you know, or flip one way or the other. Anyway, I've got all the bullish stocks there. The average prices have crossed up. That's that step number one. Step number two, this number here is saying how many days are they or have they been in an average price crossover? So uh, all I'm looking for is, is it more than 40 days? So these are all, you know, 100, uh, the, the lowest number is 80 days. But all I'm looking for is how long has that trend been in effect? So again, we've done uh, number one over here, the average prices are crossed. We've got four, 40 days in trend number two. And then I can also look back and say uh, how, let me just uh, sort by those. So I can also sort by, do we have price actually moving upwards? So are we in? Is price actually moving? So that's what this uh, third step is. How much is price moving? So all I've done is I've sorted them. Uh, we can see that the top one there, NVIDIA, is up 24% in the last 60 days. That's what it's telling me. So the average prices are up. It's been in an average price trend, a mechanical trend for at least 40 days to help me avoid false starts. And price is actually moving over the last 60 days. So I've got three conditions to help me figure out, is this chart trending without actually looking at the charts? Then I'm looking for, let me just tidy up a little bit. Uh, then I'm looking for retracing. So we've got three, is it trending criteria? And we've got one, um, is it retracing? Because now that I know that it's trending and these stocks over here on the left are trending, I'm looking for a dip in an uptrend. Again, let me just visually tell you what we're looking for. So this is what we're looking for. That's a trend. That's what I'm expecting to see over here on the left. Those stocks that I've just segmented, that's what I'm expecting to see, an uptrend. And what I'm looking for is the dip in the uptrend, the downward move, because now I've got a trending stock. Any downward movements like we saw on the S&P chart that we focused on for most of the session, any downward movements in context to the trend is a dip. When are we going to be interested 
is when it's either at one below the 20 or below the 50 period moving average. I'm going to qualify that as a dip. And the second uh, possibility is it's down 10% in 10 days. So we've got a nice, healthy, deep correction. It can be one. It can be the other. It can be both. Usually we'll get the first one and we'll always and we'll sometimes have the second one. So we'll most of the time get the first one, uh, the, the 20 and the 50 period moving So the next thing then is I can see uh, these columns here that I'm just highlighting over here on the left in the watch list. I've got blue, 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 lots of blues, all blue. There's actually only one chart there. If I just highlight the row below it, that says red, blue, blue. So what's going on there is price is... As we can see, it's trending upwards. We've got our average price crossover. It's been in a trend for 279 days. It's going up and has been going up in the last 60 days for, uh, it, oh, it's up 23%. So it is physically moving upwards. So we're expecting to see a trend. It is actually moving, which is great. But then we've got this uh, red, blue, blue. So what's going on here is in, in relation to the moving averages, it's below the 20, but it's above the 50 period moving average. And obviously it's above the 200 period moving average. That's what those, that's what those boxes are telling me. So we've got red, we've got blue, uh, blue. So what it's telling me is we're below the 20 period, we're above the 50 and we're above the 200. So we've got this retracement in the context of a trend. Let me pause there. That's what I see over on the left. It takes far longer to explain than to actually do. But when you get used to this, what we should see, fingers crossed, when, <laughs> fingers crossed when we go and look at the charts, that we should see something like I've drawn here. We should see something like that. Now, let me go to the S&P first we should see something, again, we're expecting to see price trending. We're expecting to see price back below the moving averages, back below the moving averages. That's what we're expecting to see, just so you've got a visual comparison. So we can do all of that. When we know what we're looking for, we can start to scan for it. And most people scan for things without knowing what we're looking for. So we know what we're looking for. This is a dip in an uptrend. Most people just look for sell-offs and think that they're buying dips but we need to know what the trend is to be able to determine what the dip is or if we have one. Fingers crossed, everyone. Let's see if we see it. It's a magic trick. Will it be there? Yay! There's our trend. Average prices crossed up in a trend for 200 and uh, what was it? 79 days. Over the last 60 days, it's up 23%. Visually, now we're looking at the chart, we can see it is actually going up. It starts at the bottom left. It finishes at the top right. I can see that over the last eight, 12 months. So every time price comes below the 50 or below the 20 is a buyable dip. Guess where we are right now? This is what a dip in an uptrend looks like. This is what it means to me to buy the dip in an uptrend. And that's how I scan for it. So I've got one thing to do today. I've got one stock to look at today. BBWI, that's my trend. So I'm going to draw a line of sight. Now, in fairness, I'm already in this. I've got a, a trade on here. But as price goes back above uh, the 20-period moving average, let's just call it $65.75. If it goes back above my line of the sand, I'm going to be, a, if I wasn't already in the trade, I'd be looking to be a buyer. So that's all I need to wait for. Wait for it to go back above $65.75. Give it, take a penny or two. And I'm going to be a buyer. Stop loss, as we mentioned earlier, if you are physically trading stock, the stop loss goes past the lowest point of retracements. You can work out your position size. It's going to be that much. I typically target the first target of a retest of the high there. Uh, let me just uh, work that out. So I'm going to risk that much little teeny tiny box, entry to the stop loss. So that's the risk. And the reward is initially up to a retest of the high. Can visually everyone see that the risk is, a, that the reward is about twice as much as the risk. The red box 
is about half the size of the green box. So what do you think? Does that look like a good trade? What do you think? Does that look like a good trade? So that's the uh, risk and the reward. So first target that now. I'm calling that a first target. There's quite possibly a second target available. Let's just keep it simple and say that a retest of the recent high is uh, what we can expect. So we've got uh, risking, what, $2 to make $4. Oh, that's good. I like that. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a low dollar move, but you know what? There's a high expectancy of a low dollar move. High expectancy of a low, of a low dollar move. Now we can work out a bigger target. I think there'll be a second target. I think we'd see price moving further. You could keep it simple and just double that. Back of the envelope stuff. You don't need to complicate it. You can look at what price has done recently. The last time it moved, oh, it looks like it went from 60 to 70. It looks like it did $10 last time. Over here, it went from 55 to 65. It looks like it did $10 there. It went from uh, 50 to 60. So it looks like this has the potential to move $10. So if we're at 65, then it could get up to 75. So it wouldn't be unrealistic to think that a... It wouldn't be unrealistic to think that we could or that we may see a move up to there. So now that looks better. So how do we work that out? And this might be a good place to finish. How did we work that out? All I did was say, okay, what did it move last time? What did it move last time? What did it move last time? It looks like it moves $10, $10, $10. The last few times it's moved from the 50 higher, from the 50 higher, from the 50 higher. Again, we're not quite at the 50, but nonetheless, that's about $10. So it wouldn't be unrealistic to expect that that's where we could get to. So target one, retest of the high. I always do that, retest the high. And then target two, potentially up to $75. That looks good. I'm already in this from a few weeks ago. Slightly different entry, but nonetheless, don't need to worry about it. Just waiting for it to go to target. I think that might be a good place to land this plane. Uh, ladies and gentlefolk, uh, what was your big takeaway from today's session? What was your big takeaway from today's session? Pop a comment in the chat box. I'll take any questions. If you've got a question, now's time to type it. If you haven't already done so, I, don't, I think I've caught everyone's. Uh, but if you've got a question, type it out. Uh, I'll get to it. I'll stay around and answer any final questions. Uh, what was your biggest takeaway from the session? I'll just take a quick drink while everyone's just typing away. Absolutely, Perry. Yeah, look at the big picture. Look at the big picture. Frame of reference, awesome. Be in the right direction. Go with the money flow, perfect. Better to be, better to go with the money flow than to be right. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, here's a, here's a thought for you, Randall, uh, and we've spoken about this uh, privately. Um, would you rather make money or would you rather be right? <laughs> I know which one I would rather do. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> everyone's typing make money. I, you know, I, 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 yeah, I mean, with the way that we apply our um, money management, you know, we can make money when our trade ideas don't work. So it, it's, it's no big deal. It truly is no big deal. You know, make money when you're wrong. That's what the, um, I've included to, to make, try and make it obvious. You know, we are applying hedging strategies in our trade management. And, you know, it's the same principles, the same strategies that are used when I manage my uh, hedge funds. It's how most, it's, I mean, the clues in the name, hedge funds, you know, use hedging strategies to manage risk. It, they are agnostic to direction. And we should always be agnostic to direction. Anyway, so that was the mechanical scan. 
We've also focused today on <coughs> visual confirmation. And uh, we also touched a little bit on trade entries today and some targeted methods as well. So we've kind of touched on all of these points today. I go into these points in a lot more detail. Uh, in my uh, program. Again, I do help traders. If you think I'm the person for you, um, then great. Let's stay around. We'll talk just a few minutes longer about that. I had a, a personal realization recently that, or I relearned this lesson recently. The best way to learn how a portfolio is being managed is to actually see a portfolio being managed. So if you want to join us, I, I've recently started a group training program. The last time I ran this, uh, I ran uh, a trade room back in uh, 2007, 8, 9, and it was very successful back then. Um, and I've restarted a similar experience recently. So if you'd like to join me in my, uh, my group program, uh, we've got lots and lots and lots of lots of uh, things included. Uh, ultimately, we've got the, the group training. Now, compared to the one-on-one -on -one mentorship, you will be saving about $8,500. I am not cheap by any measure. However, the group program should give you uh, an excellent cost saving um, compared to one-on-one -on -one training. We have Quick Start Blueprints. Now, the, the DIY, DIY version of this program, uh, that does sell for $3,000. Again, I'm not cheap. I'm very good. You're tapping into 30 years of experience so that you don't have to have 30 years of experience to figure it out on your own. You can circumnavigate all those losses that we saw earlier. Uh, but we've got quick start blueprint training. It's just the essentials to make it work. And if you do have a knowledge gap, if you do have a knowledge gap, then you can uh, dive into the uh, the deep dive training. So you get full access to the program. You'll save 50% on that. That's going to and save you $1,500. There is a decision tree. It's just a checklist at the moment. I keep trying to find and make a pretty little picture so it looks like this on the right. Uh, I'm not uh, creative in that way, so please bear with me. At the moment, it's just a checklist. Um, nonetheless, it's a handy decision map. You can quite literally go down the checklist, which is all I do, and all you've seen me do today is go down the checklist, step one, step two, step three. Oh, there's a stock for us to go and trade. Then we'd have the, the entry checklist. We'd go, you know, where's my entry, my exit, my stops, my targets, great. There's my entry checklist. And then we'd go and put the trade on and then we'll manage it along the way. So it quite literally is a decision tree. Um, if it's not going right, we're going to manage that trade. That's what the hedging elements of the, the trade management system. Now, as you can probably appreciate, that's the real secret to uh, any success. It's not the money we make, it's the money we keep. Aha, uh -huh. cliche again, I love my cliches. Uh, you'll also tap into what I'm trading. Uh, if you want to look at what I'm doing, again, you'll see every trade that I place, you'll have the interest, the stops, targets, uh, plus any portfolio adjustments along the way. When I ran my alert service, again, I ran an alert service for oh, several years now. Um, I used to pretty much send that uh, an email out and give people access to it. It was $500 a month for access to that. Um, again, that's included. You're not paying it. You got, you know, it's all included. Uh, you'll tap into my portfolio. You'll have immediate access to a plug and play portfolio, which is all the profitable stocks you saw me uh, going through. I'm not looking at every stock every day. It's just a fruitless exercise to look at 28,000 stocks. All I want to do is look at the top 30, the top 50. My universe is actually just 100 stocks. My active universe is 30. There's plenty of money to be had from a handful of stocks. Again, all the portfolios in the that are managed successfully, whether it's billions of dollars. Again, look at Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett's made all his money off trading eight or nine stocks at a time. Think about that for a moment. We don't have to trade everything. We just need to find something that is realistically and viably tradable with this strategy. So that's what we've got here. Uh, we also uh, introduced their uh, prop stock trading. Everyone loves this at the moment. I, I personally, I had a, quite an emotional experience when we introduced this to see the speed with which people have uh, picked this up. Um, you know, prop shop training, you know, uh, pitch me your trade. You know, the, the fastest way to, um, to accelerate your learning, your understanding of a system is to kind of present your trade ideas to me so I can give you the course corrections along the way. So it is the fastest way to turn all the knowledge that you've got and any gaps that you have into repeatable trading results. Uh, and of course, when you uh, need support, you've got it. And that is 
my, uh, you know, what's involved with my group mentorship. I do have software and tools and um, you see me use TradeStation. They're only available on TradeStation. It's just what I prefer to use. So although it's not listed there, if you want all the sexy, uh, fancy tools, you'll have access to the custom tools that we see here. There's also a few other scans there. There's another uh, scan there. Uh, as well, that will find other stocks and opportunities as well. Uh, but if you do decide to use TradeStation, then uh, you'll have access to exactly the same tools and layouts and templates that I'm using. So if you'd like to be involved, we have our next live session on Monday. And there is some extra information on uh, the link. I'm just popping a link in the chat box. If so, if you are interested and you'd like to uh, join us for the next group uh, session, which is on Monday, please feel free to come along. And um, there's a link with some more details in the chat box. If you'd like to ask me any questions about that, just send me an email. I'm uh, very open to discussing and trying to help you determine if what I do is right for you. And if it is right for you, then we can uh, discuss what steps to take next. And if it's not, I'll always point you in the right direction for what you're looking for. Uh, I do try and promise and uh, do that for everyone. Because I, again, I appreciate that, you know, what I do isn't right for everyone. You know, everyone's looking for something just a little bit different. Um, relative to their situation. And if you think that I can help you, then we can talk about it. But as I'll you know, at that point have got to know what you are looking for, if it's not what I do, then again, I'll always try and put you off in the right direction. Anyway, with that said, I think that's a great place to press eject on today's session. Uh, once again, thank you for staying around. Thank you for um, spending uh, an hour with me. I, I fully appreciate that we could all be doing other things. Uh, and it's just uh, fabulous that you've decided to spend it with me and everyone else today. So uh, whatever you're up to, have a fabulous weekend. Uh, I'm off to a, a music festival this weekend. I'm going to pretend I'm 20 again. <laughs> I'm going to grumble, grumble at bad, knee, bad knees, bad music. This, this is too loud. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Randall. Um, I will see you all uh, next Friday.